Welcome to this new Talks on Contemporary Art, which feature artists, curators, writers, educators, university scholars. Today we will welcome Sandra Brewster, a visual artist based in Toronto, and Nalini Moabir, assistant professor of postcolonial geography at Concordia University. This conversation will present a brief overview of Sandra Brewster's career, practice, and the present exhibition on view at Optica. I'm Marie-Josée Lafortune. I'm the director of Optica Contemporary Art Center. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Optica is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyangé Haaga Nation is recognized as the custodian of the lands and water on which we gather today. We respect the continued connection with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationship with indigenous and other people within the Tioja Wei Montreal community. Since 1972, Optica has sought to promote Canadian contemporary art and to raise awareness among diverse audience about the issue underlying the discourse and practice in the, in the visual arts through a varied program of exhibition and critical and educational activities. It defined itself as a space of discovery and experimentation and as a reference point in contemporary art for all audience. It is my real pleasure to introduce you, Nalini Moabi and Sandra Brewster. Thank you so much for, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, Optica Gallery for hosting this conversation. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name uh, is Nalini Mohabir, and it's my great honor to be here with Toronto-based visual artist Sandra Brewster. Her work explores identity, representation, and memory, and centers the Black presence. As the daughter of Guyanese-born um, parents, she is especially attuned to the experiences of people of Caribbean heritage and their ongoing relationships with back home. Brewster's work has been featured at the Art Gallery of Ontario in 2019-2020. She's also the 2018 recipient of the Toronto Friends of the Visual Arts Artist Prize, and her exhibition, It's All a Blur, received the Gattuso Prize for Outstanding Featured Exhibition at the Contact Photography Festival in 2017. Brewster holds a Master's of Visual Studies from the University of Toronto and she's represented by Georgia Sherman Projects. That's only the short bio, and we'll be discussing some of the details as we um, trace her experiences in our conversation. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you very much, Nalini. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Marie Jose, and to Esther for holding down the fort at Optica. Um, the installation shots look beautiful, and it's really nice to be be acquainted with you, Nalini, and we've known each other for a while now. <laughs> so it's really great to be here. I thought maybe we'd start off with um, the place where we first met, which is South Africa, when we were on an internship for young Canadians who were sent to South Africa. Um, and we were there five years after apartheid fell. And when we were there, we witnessed this, this creativity, this, this wellspring of creativity um, that came about through the work that artists and cultural workers were doing around decolonization and the project of social and cultural transformation. And I think for all of us, um, all of the Canadians who were there, uh, South Africa was a place where we became undone and remade again. And one of the organizations that we worked closely with, especially you, was the Historic Community Arts Project, or CAP, which was headed by Graham Falcon at the time. In preparation for our conversation, I dug up some of my old CAP journals. <laughs> <laughs> and the introduction states, may we go beyond the boundaries which have been set for us and which we ourselves have set. May we be equal to the task of developing new challenging forms. And this imperative reminds me of your cool portraits in your first exhibition um, that I saw held at CAP. Could you tell us more about this exhibit? Well, first I want to share my experience when I first encountered South Africa. Yes. You know, I was a young artist and I was really excited about going 
to South Africa, especially because we were going to be working with arts organizations there. And I look forward to working with different artists and uh, different kinds of platforms, right? And it seemed that when we we landed there, we were, like I was submerged, especially where I was working, because at first I worked with um, uh, Arts Throb, which is a uh, website that is run by uh, Sue Williamson. And I was kind of submerged in this controversial debate that included a white South African artist that was engaging with appropriation of a Kosa culture uh, ritual. Um, Tembin Kosi Goniwe, who became a good friend of mine, he, what he is an artist and a writer, and he was very involved with um, making sure that this debate was held intelligently and taken seriously and not considered, you know, this passive kind of action that we are to take, take for granted because it had to do with art, as if anything can just be taken up under the name of art. There were people who were part of the coastal communities who were very concerned about this white South African dealing with such a subject matter. And Tembi was one of the people who backed the importance of having a formal panel discussion around it. And what, you know, what kind of resonated with me was, was that, you know, many artists, they wanted to be represented in the same format as the white South Africans were. They wanted to be, um, they wanted to be respected. They wanted their work to be on the same types of platforms. They wanted to center their practices and they wanted their culture to be center and they did not want to be treated passively. And I just, when I was there, it just blew my mind because, you know, being back home and being a young artist and having to exhibit in all sorts of alternative spaces. And it always seemed to be this huge fight to get into any types of spaces where they would take your work seriously or take the time to consider your practices, although they may not understand the subject matter. It was just really uh, inspiring to me that you know, these folks were putting themselves forward in such a way, right? And so when I was at CAP, it was also interesting to this whole uh, community arts project, which is what CAP is. <laughs> it was also interesting, the work that they were doing there. And I had decided, um, I was working with this other woman who was from San Francisco, and she and I were building up one of the spaces to become an art store for some of the artists who were working out of that space. And so uh, we were, I think we were asked or we offered to do an exhibition in that space before it turned into this shop. And um, I had decided to create, uh, to continue the series Cool that I had started back in Toronto. So Cool is composed of these close, cup, close cropped portraits of black people and I was aligning these portraits with this idea of cool. At the time I was reading um, Flash of the Spirit that is written by, <laughs> by Robert Ferris Thompson. <laughs> so Flash of the Spirit written by Robert Ferris Thompson. He discusses how cool was derived in West African and West African communities uh, through statuary and sculpture and it seems like this positioning this expression of cool that I was looking at in you know regular everyday people is like an expression that is necessary a focus that is necessary in order to deal with such structures because we already know that we do not need certain types of um, approval we already come full of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we it's almost like a strategy in which to enter these spaces or in order to center our experiences of which we know should already be centered despite 
what circumstances the world has put people in. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for reminding me of that debate that um, mm -hmm. you were uh, immersed in when, when you arrived in South Africa. And it was that, that kind of energy that where things were, there were important national uh, questions at stake at that time that gave all those de debates a kind of urgency. Um, you know, the questions of uh, what is art versus artifacts, so that uh, sometimes, you know, the people, uh, if, if it was classified as artifact, could come in and, and claim it, right, or, or discover it. And then there was, so there were these questions around what are the conditions, like why don't we recognize the conditions under which art is produced and has been produced even under, um, you know, the worst uh, ex excesses of apartheid. How do we um, create space uh, for recognizing the labor that goes into that work, the labor of like the painted signs in the townships, for example, mm -hmm. as also a kind of art, as the expressions of art all around us. That was um, a really important time. And I think having come from, you know, having spent, uh, both of us spending a year in South Africa, um, where those debates were taking place daily and then coming back to Canada. Wow. It was really difficult for me because um, you know, the, the questions didn't seem as urgent. And um, when we talked about change, uh, it was usually through uh, the tool of the grant application. And I found that, um, that uh, a difficult switch to make. And I was wondering what were your experiences when you came back in terms of your negotiations or experiences of the art world in Toronto? Yeah, I totally hear you because when I returned to Toronto, I had this, uh, you know, I had all of this energy in me from South Africa. I remember times in South Africa where somebody would have an idea about starting a project or starting some kind of activity. And I would think, oh yeah, people are just talking. But the next week we would, understand even it was it was something simple as a drum circle uh this is where we're going to pick up the drums this is how much it will cost this is our teacher this is the location it would just happen just like that and I remember just being told a week ago that this was going to happen mm -hmm. you know people would talk about taking over um you know the pan-african market and uh it happened you know starting a publication and it happened so, and it's not like any formal bureaucratical structure was part of the making of all of these things. People, and I know I may be, you know, romanticizing in a way and also being a person who is not from there, it allowed me some access that maybe other people were not allowed. Although who I'm talking about were just folks that I made friends with while I was there. So, you know, coming back home, it, you know, I had that energy, right? And that, but I found that there was a lot of things that barred me from getting things done. And that did not stop me from, you know, collaborating with artists in maybe unique or unconventional ways. I also used to put on an exhibition at my house for three years. You know, we had this exhibition called Open House. And it was in response to um, this area, the Junction Triangle area. Uh, there were artists here who were putting on exhibitions with, you know, to in, in order to enliven the area. However, I never saw any black artists or artists of color who were involved in these exhibitions. So I started this open house and just called it Artists of the Junction and Triangle and Junction Triangle area. And then when you come to the show, the majority of artists are Black artists. And we had a whole stream full of people who would flow through the house. The first year, we, you know, I think there were 150 people came. The last year, you know, we had like 500 people come to the opening. And so, you know, you know, these artists were able to engage with each other. And, you know, folks who just came, you know, they benefited from seeing who else was out there, right? So, you know, a lot of times, we have to basically, you know, do this, what I guess they call grassroots kind of 
uh, work in order to find that energy that we have experienced elsewhere. But yeah, so those are the kinds of things, you know, I ended up doing with other people in order to find this energy uh, that I experienced elsewhere, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's maybe also an energy that um, our parents, uh, you know, give us as well, because oh, yeah. I think it comes from any space where there's, you know, a country that's gone through the process of decolonization. There's, um, there's great risks involved in that fight for liberation and for freedom. And um, whenever I meet, um, you know, former revolutionaries from the Caribbean time, uh, and I include the students that uh, were here in Canada as well, studying um, to build, you know, a new nation um, once the Caribbean got its independence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, a, a hardcore energy that they have that, that uh, we need to, to learn from. And uh, I think we have, um, and we take those lessons with us. And so um, I'm wondering, um, I know that you're a child of the diaspora very much, and you, uh, you've been, um, you've spent a significant amount of time in the Caribbean. You did an artist residency at Alice Yard. Uh, you were invited by Christopher Cozier, who um, also co-founded Alice Yard, uh, where you exhibited a version of uh, the Smiths. And you also spent time in Suriname with Marcel Pinas. Um, and I'm wondering how did the visual content the art practices, the energies of the Caribbean influenced you? I must say first that um, from what you were saying below before about, you know, these energies that we get from, you know, our parents basically or from folks from the Caribbean. And I think uh, like in my case, in your case, possibly too, you know, from those, you know, from the late 60s and early 70s, like they're the ones who came here and started Caravana, right? And Caravana was, you know, basically one of the first actions that assisted Canada in finding its multicultural um, flair, <laughs> you know, the idea that we have communities from all over. It started, you know, all of these street festivals that we have in Toronto. You know, I, you know, sometimes on a weekend, there would be three or four different cultural street festivals happening in the city. Yeah. And Caravana is to, is, we should thank Caravana for that, especially since it wasn't a gift to the city on its centennial. It wasn't something that was funded really, right? Like they came here and they were emulating a carnival that was happening in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And uh, they ended up including everybody into it. And it was just so joyful. And it also asserted their presence on this land, it, right? Mm -hmm. So, as well, my mother, when she came here, a lot of her friends, a few of her friends, they decided to start the Senior Guyanese Association in order to connect their parents to each other. Some of these folks did not even know that their friends were now here in Toronto. And so, you know, this, this consistent need to enforce community and also to acquaint themselves with a new place um to further themselves in order to you know get a better life for themselves as well as their children this idea of taking care of each other it's um it's so uh present right and i think that for a lot of us it's instilled within us and so a lot of the work that we do those ideas are embedded in a lot of the work that we do right in uh, Trinidad, Christopher Cozy, he had invited me to do a residency at Alice Yard, which I was really excited to do. And uh, I went during the time of carnival, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and while I was there, um, oh my gosh, carnival was so exhausting and so much fun at the same time. And by the way, I was there to make arts, right? <laughs> So I started uh, by um, looking at my Smith series. My Smith series is composed of these uh, simply drawn or simply rendered characters wearing an Afro. And then the faces are replaced with the Smith section of the phone book. The idea behind the Smiths is to mock this notion of monolithic black 
communities that you know in each individual is the same as the next one within specific communities which is impossible um while i while you know i also put these um these characters in some visual narratives um some of them included uh narratives that that focused on uh on uh, violence in black communities here in Toronto. I remember when I came back from South Africa, you know, we were inundated with all of these stories about, you know, gun violence in parts of Toronto and Scarborough. And uh, after I found out a friend of mine, her son was also killed this way. I asked a poet friend of mine, Joseph Daly, to write a poem that expressed the feelings that we, we feel the feelings that are within us about hearing another person being killed in this way. And then I illustrated each line of the poem using the Smiths as community members within this narrative mm -hmm. of, um, that expressed his writing, which was beautiful visual writing. Um, I also used the Smiths in other kinds of narratives. There was one that was focusing on a uh, musician, high life musician, um, Nigerian, uh, Fela Kuti. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were these articles that I was uh, in, being influenced by, whereby people would go to meet with Fela after one of his long performances on stage. But they had to wait for him for such a long time because he would sleep for hours to regain his energy. <laughs> So in one piece, I have the Smiths in the windows behind Fella sleeping, right? And I call it Fella sleeping. And all the Smiths, all the community folks are waiting for Fella to rise. Um, also, I, I, you know, because of, um, you know, some, and I remember when Trayvon Martin had, was killed, right? And so I was in an exhibition in Pennsylvania. And um, uh, it just so happened that this, and this horrible incident happened around the time that this exhibition was forming. And so the exhibition was called Performing Whiteness, Performing Blackness. And I used this time to create a piece that depicted the Smiths in procession to allude to all of the, um, the marches, the protests, the processions that were happening within the Black community in protests of gun violence against Black people. So the Smiths were used in all of these different narratives. And then I started to grid them to relate to like, the expansiveness of the Smiths. And there's a time element in there too. In the grids, there is like this, I don't know, this illusion of movement in some way because the heads are going in all these different <laughs> Uh, formulations, as well as because they go off, they're in the formation of a grid and they go off onto either side, there is a solution to, you know, infinity, right? Um, so, so yes, yeah, so while I was in Trinidad, I used the Smiths, uh, but I then I, I morphed them into Mohammed's <laughs> because Mohammed is the largest name in the phone book, at least that's what I found while I was there. And, uh, be, and because I was around the time of carnival, I allowed that to really inspire how I would present the Mohammeds at that time. Mm -hmm. I created aluminum structures of them, and then I put them, I situated them throughout the compound, as well as I created a mural on, in, the, um, in the exhibition space of Alice Yard. In that mural, you have a procession of all of the Mohammeds walking throughout the walls, and then they mash up or they butt up against a, um, a carnival reveler. Mm -hmm. And during this time, I was, uh, I was participating in this mass camp called Cat and Bag Productions. And um, this is a small camp of like 50 people or a small band of about 50 people. And we would always have to squeeze through these gargantuan bands of like thousands of people, very expensive, you know, with their little bikinis and stuff. But we had, you know, like we were more like grounded in, uh, you know, folklore and, um, <laughs> you know, we decorated our costumes, our sailor costume. And yeah, we were a small band that had to like squeeze through. So I think what I was doing 
for me anyway, this whole installation was to uh, to kind of allude to my experience there in Trinidad. During that time as well, Christopher, he had encouraged me to go to Suriname, to this town called Mongo, where, where Marcel Pinas uh, lived and is an artist. Um, in that town, there was a civil war and many people had died. And Marcel had created a monument for the, those people there and has continued to invite artists to uh, create artworks and leave artworks in the town and also to do workshops and such with the children of the town. Mm -hmm. So although I was not a resident artist there, I went there just for a few days to see what he was doing. And it was just wonderful. It was really interesting. And I have I had some ideas of what I could do there while I was there. But um, uh, you know, one of those ideas are still in formulation right now. But uh, but yeah, I think that my experience in Trinidad and in Suriname really impacted how I see practice and also the idea of play behind your behind uh, behind a practice, right? Because when I went there, I did not know what I was going to do. <laughs> and then I just started playing with, you know, former ideas and materials and such. And yeah, it kind of, it really helped me to, you know, to figure out how I should, um, how I should, you know, foresee a practice in the arts, mm -hmm. as well as engaging with Christopher, who's such a generous soul, has also impacted my life as an artist. Absolutely, I would say. Give thanks, Christopher. He's yeah. incredible. <laughs> um, it also feels like that idea of the yard, like to come into someone's yard, to you know, have that kind of space that's not private but not public. There's something kind of in between as what you were thinking of when you had your art exhibits in your yard mm -hmm. in Toronto. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so, definitely. Yeah. I think that... Well, he, you know, Alice Yard was one of the reasons I think that I did do open house here, as well as other things too, like uh, Ken Montague, he used to have his exhibitions called, Wet. well, he has his organization called Wedge, but he would have these Wedge exhibitions at his condo um, here in Toronto. And I remember experiencing them and thinking, you know, this is a really good way of exhibiting works by of people and, you know, on your own terms as well. And so... You know, there are people who, you know, have done these, um, these, uh, you know, unconventional ways of, you know, being part of an art world, which I find is really wonderful. Um, I wanted to turn to your thesis, if I may. Um, your writing is, is absolutely beautiful, by the way. Um, and I guess I was quite taken with it because so much of what you wrote felt familiar to me because uh, my parents, like yours, um, came from Guyana around the same time. Um, they arrived in Canada. Uh, my Aji or my granny also babysat. Uh, in our apartment, we had the same brown plaid couch that you had that I think is probably mandatory West Indian decor. Um, <laughs> My parents also, you know, made friends with people in the grocery store. And as you said earlier, and I think you were quoting Dion Brand, we come full of ourselves, who we are and will become. And that, you know, alluding to our memories, our histories, our love of mangoes, it all comes with us when we migrate. And so you were working with that idea through the materiality of the photos in your family's photo album. But you weren't thinking only about the transmission of memories. You were also carefully selecting those photographs um, to highlight moments of optimism, maybe even um, what my friend Carol Marie Webster calls critical joy. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was thinking about Fred Moten because he points out that cultural workers, Black cultural workers, are often um, expected to play an oppositional role in our kind of typecast in that, into that role of oppositional, which constrains other possibilities. And I was wondering if you could talk to um, 
the, the photographs that you were using in your thesis mm -hmm. and how you returned to them. I love that term, critical joy. Yeah. I, really do. I think that I've never thought of that before, like those two words. Yeah. Because we have, um, yeah, and then also what you're mentioning about what uh, Fred Moulton says about, uh, you know, our our obligation, right? What we must do in these spaces and such. And at the same time, then we cannot, yeah, then it just becomes almost burdensome rather than what your friend brings with this idea of critical joy. Mm -hmm. I think the, the photographs, um, when I look at the photographs that I have of my family, I see in them this, um, this impression of, you know, it's like this impression that there's something, I'm just forgetting the word, that's why I keep on pausing, <laughs> but there's this feeling of anticipation, right? There's this feeling of anticipation that there's something to come. However, at the same time, they do not know what that is going to be. So there's this excitement. Yet we know that, and I think in cases in Guyana, you know, from talking to my family, it's not like leaving Guyana was an absolute choice. They left, however, the circumstances in which they lived made them feel they had to leave in order to better their lives, not only for themselves, but for future generations. And so they left home and then they had to deal with the huge challenge of creating a new home somewhere else where they may not see they may not see so many people like themselves. And so it becomes this, this huge challenge. What is so interesting to me with Fred Moten, I think a lot of us live by these things, but Fred Moten has a way of uh, languaging it, right? Is that when these folks come here, they also find ways to link back to back home. So their experiences with, you know, basement parties, Right. So I remember as a kid, my cousins and I and all these non-blood cousins, we would all travel together with our parents to some basement party that our parents, that some one of them were having. But we would all be huddled up in a, in a living in a living room or in a, a big master bedroom somewhere while the parents are partying, you know. But but these 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 kind of areas were possibly these experiences were possibly similar to the experiences they had back home. So they're bringing these experiences here. Um, you know, there's this photograph that I use as part of a piece I did called Hiking Black Creek that includes my mother and my father, I think like a year after he arrived here. My mom came here three years before my father and she had a scent for my father. And, um, and, uh, this, this photo depicts them, you know, in the woods of Black Creek. And I've always looked at this photo so curiously, acknowledging that it's not like a, a common newcomer photograph. It's like something where, you know, these two people are reacquainting themselves with each, with each other, as well as acquainting themselves with this new place in which they're going to live through an action of hiking in the outdoors, right? Also, Guyana, you know, the majority of the landscape is the Amazon. And so I imagine my father going into the interior, who knows how often he did that. But it's interesting that they would pick this action to do, right, in Toronto. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, so I don't know if I'm totally answering your question, but I'm finding resonance in your, in your question through this through this term of like critical joy, as well as Fred Moten's um, almost like a challenge to us to not only take on these um, these important um, these important challenges, but also to do so in this critical way, right? And to find to to not forget like what makes us right when we are when we are, um, 
when, when we are working towards a more equitable world, right. a more world of just. Yeah. Right? Beautifully said. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, resistance, but also all aspects of who makes you. And mm -hmm. yeah, important. Um, I'm also thinking about another aspect of your thesis exhibition, um, which visits a different landscape um, in Guyana, and a, a landscape that I think of as as a radical imaginative space. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's because it's unlike any space I've ever seen in Canada. It's the Essequibo River, oh, wow. mm -hmm. where the river's mouth, uh, as you know, mm -hmm. is, is large and contains islands, um, which as uh, some Ghanaians like to exaggerate, says, I, and they say islands bigger than Barbados, but <laughs> not quite, but <laughs> almost, you can imagine it. Um, but it's really an unreal landscape in which you can you can feel the the spirits in the land and in the water. And um, as part of your thesis exhibition, um, the gel transfer process that you used gave a, a beautiful, almost weathered look to the images you took of the Essequibo River, where uh, memory, migrant time, the movement of rivers all fold into one in, uh, into each other. And I'm wondering if you could say more about the personal significance of this space um, where land meets water. Um, what does it mean to you? Oh, wow. I think that um, where land meets water. I think when I was doing the whole series, the Essequibo series, I was doing it in response to the stories I was told about the Essequibo, similar to what you're saying. These exaggerated also <laughs> ways that the, land, the, the river is expansive. It's huge. It goes on forever. Yeah. The water is brown and the leaves fall into the water and they change the color of the water. The, you know, like there's piranhas under the water when you put, don't put your hand inside, <laughs> you know, all of these things, right? So I was, I love the, the metaphorical possibilities in that particular river because of everything that I've been told about it. And also the fear of, you know, uh, speed boating through it as well, because, you know, like <laughs> you're in the speed boat, leaning back and going zoom right across and you feel like you can walk, fall in at any time. All of these things for me, it's related to the actual experience of these folks living in this country and then leaving there because it was kind of hard and going uh, to another place where it's going to be hard you know, finding your way, figuring out your home, all of these things. So I thought that the river itself, the Essequibo River itself was, uh, because it's also a river of movie, moving water as well, you know, movement is embedded in there. And so metaphorically, I felt that, you know, that image and everything it, it, it brought with it related to a human condition or like their actual experiences right it's embedded in who they are and that's why I felt the river was a good yeah it was a good symbol for you know uh, what I was trying to do with that thesis project mm -hmm. yeah I remember when uh, I was first asked to do uh, like in Bushra Janaid she had um Bushra Janaid had a, had curated an exhibition in Newfoundland Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, at the moment, I can't remember the name of the exhibition. What carries us? Say that again? What carries us? That's a recent exhibition that she did in Newfoundland at the rooms, but this one was at another gallery. Oh, she's going to kill me because I, I can't remember. But, <laughs> but this exhibition was uh, the first one that she did. Um, uh, I think it was in uh, 2016 or 17. And we had, uh, it was a group exhibition and she was trying to make the connections between Newfoundland and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And I was just doing some, you know, small, like kind of shallow, not shallow, but like some beginning research and found that uh, 
you know, one of their rums, this rum that they have in uh, Newfoundland called Cabot, Cabot Rum, is is made of Demerara rum. And I'm like, oh, Demerara is the river in Guyana. And so I immediately connected to connected it to, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and, you know, Demerara sugar as well. And looking at the path of, you know, from Africa to the Americas and then to Europe. And there must have been some kind of connection, although, you know, deep in Canada's history, we do not teach that. We do not put that forward the way that it should be put forward. Although many artists are, you know, engaging with that, you know, Camille Turner and Charmaine Lurch. And there are many artists who are talking about these things. But um, so that's actually when the first Esokubo piece happened. And it was not done on Mylar like the pieces are done in my thesis. It was done on paper. And so in some areas, the paper had had worn and torn and such. And I had transferred the river to the surface after I had washed areas of the surface with with a brown paint that alluded to the the brown color of the water, as well as the relationship with the color of rum as well. Yeah. And the river being the space where these goods would be transported. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, it, I really am in love with those pieces um, about the Essequibo River. Um, so all of those experiences, you know, come to bear uh, on the works that you produce and um, your current show at Octica mm -hmm. um, is an exhibit of pieces that you've been working on for uh, for the last eight years, at least. Um, and these ideas of, of movement are, are continuing um, in this exhibit. So um, at Optica Gallery, there's the, the series Blur, which are produced, um, which are photographs produced by a long shutter exposure, and then uh, gel, gel transfer, if I'm getting that right, to emphasize a body in motion rather than the facial features of an individual. And it's uh, being um, it's on display alongside the Smith series, um, where the figures and the kind of gestural drawings emphasize anonymity and interchangeability. And I was wondering, um, what's your impulse behind these series, particularly when you first started um, nearly a decade ago? And how do you see them in conversation with each other? Uh, well, the Blur series began at like I, I found it was kind of a critical point <laughs> while I was going to U of T where I was, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, what I'm doing there. And so I started to pare down all of these ideas I was having. I knew that I have a tendency to work with people or would want communities to be engaged in the work somehow. Mm -hmm. And then I liked this, um, element of movement. Uh, I like the idea of movement. And I know that I always work uh, within, you know, trying to engaging with ideas around, I know, interrogating ideas around identity. And so I had asked people to I come into the studio. I have like a, a nice studio <laughs> at UFT. And I asked people to come into the studio. And I basically shared with them that this was an investigation of sorts and what my interests were, which is what I just outlined. And also that the fact that a lot of the work that I do has to do with this idea of back home and this movement of people from one place to another place. So I kept these elements in mind when I was creating the work. I asked people to um, move in front of the camera and I took images of them, like you said, at a low shutter speed. And uh, so that it would capture the movement, right? And then I, uh, it was later on that I had decided to transfer these images onto different surfaces. and. Um, and because of 
again, this, the transferring process is another way of transferring something from one place to another place because it, through the process of the transfer, the ink is being removed from one surface and being transferred to another surface. Because of the work that's put into that process, there are creases and tears and such. Sometimes the ink does not adhere to the surface and it reveals an idea of, or an illusion of change of some way, in some way. So, you know, the, the interpretive possibilities with each of these stages, um, it all came back to my focus around movement of people, uh, specifically Caribbean folks. There was also a time element there as well, right? Because in capturing the movement, you're capturing a person who, I hate that word capturing, but we, we are, you know, uh, depicting a person from one stage to another stage, which also resonates with what you are bringing up uh, that um, that quote by Dion Brand, right? And also the relationship between the Blurs and the Smiths, there's absolutely a relationship there. And also the fact that in some cases with the Blurs, I do situate them in grids. So it, re it relates to the Smiths in that way formally, but also in the idea that there are many of these blurs and there's a long history of these blurs, <laughs> right? And then the inab inability to make out the specific features of each blur. And this is done so voluntarily, um, like the figures, it's on their own terms that, you know, they are not uh, revealing everything. It suggests at the same time, this coolness, right? This way that they are carrying themselves. Uh, okay to not reveal everything, you know? As they say, this opacity, yeah. right? Yeah. Glissa. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking about the Smiths, um, there's an image that stands out to me that's... Um, at, at the Optica Gallery, and it's the untitled, in brackets, plain black, um, where there's a, a realist representation of two young men, uh, two young black men in, um, I, I think one's wearing like a soccer t-shirt, uh, and the other one's like in 80s uh, kind of wear. Um, and they're over, they're uh, laid over top uh, the Smith figures, and the Smith figures in this image are kind of uh, white and uh, and smaller and um, almost fading. So, in looking at that emphasis of, of the body of these young men, um, I'm thinking about the idea that the body is a form of politics. Again, in our favorite author <laughs> Dion Brand's book *Bread Out of Stone*, um, where she, um, you know, she tells us about the ways in which um, inscribed upon the body is a you know, our, our social hierarchies uh, that are imposed, but can also be challenged. So I'm wondering if in this uh, particular uh, image, you're questioning perceptions of, of Blackness and the body. During that time, the, the piece is called Plain Black. And during that time, um, I was uh, asked to be in an exhibition that was curated by Sally Frader and Pamela Edmonds called 28 Days. And this exhibition, I believed it was challenging perceptions of Blackness in Canada, um, in addition to this time around Black History Month. And so um, this work, is the, the two figures is of the same person, this young, uh, this young man who I knew back then. And I really like this, this guy because he was really politically astute. Like he knew who he was, he understood history. And, and at the same time, he did not carry himself with this stereotypical notion of what he should be as a black man. You know, he's a skater kid, he loved rock and roll. You know, he kind of was just his own kind of guy, 
you know? And so I thought that his energy was really, um, like I loved the, I loved like who he was. So, <laughs> and I asked him if he could take part in this particular project. And so I, you know, there were two different times that I took images of him. This was the first time I also incorporated realistic representations of people among the Smiths in this way. And there's another uh, piece in the um, Optica exhibit, and that's the video installation, Walk On By. Um, and Walk On By also centers movement, but the experience of time in, in the video is different from that of Blur. Um, and I think that's partly because of the Super 8 camera that you use to film it. There's a, a sense that time is slowed down. And I'm wondering what are the kind of provocations of um, temporal space that you're working with in that video? Well, the Super 8 camera I've always been interested in because it was made during the time of like the late 60s, right? And so, and it was done so that, you know, I guess people can easily create home videos. And so when I had, um, you know, decided to do that, I bought the Super 8 camera off Craigslist, picked it up in a parking lot. And then the idea was to playfully, you know, go around town and film black folks in the city. Uh, you know, so from far, from near, but also adjust the camera in ways where by people would kind of blend into the landscape, you know, and all of this is to suggest this long history of us here. And um, yeah, so in that case, you know, you have this old format film process with these contemporary beings inside. And so it is like a mashup of time, right? which helps with this idea of presence. Um, the art practice in some way, in really subtle ways or subconsciously. And even with this idea of movement and, you know, there is a rhythm to, you know, even the blurs, right? And there's a rhythm to, you know, the grids and these little Afro heads looking up and looking down, looking around. And um, my wish to create a series of uh, animations with the Smiths. I did this one piece called Smiths Kissing and where they just start, you know, together and they part and they come together and then they part. And so I think that music is always there in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I really like the, uh, the animation. I saw it in your SFU talk. Um, so the, my last question to you is, um, is also about movement, but in uh, the other sense of the word, uh, um, political movements, the, uh, the current moment um, that we're in. And I'm wondering how your visions and your creative energies um, have been impacted by, uh, by the summer that we've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find these questions really interesting, especially, not especially, I just find these questions really interesting because, you know, there are artists who have always worked in their practices have always kind of focused on, on circumstances that are bubbling over at the moment right? It's almost like I was thinking to myself, it's almost like an we told you so moment <laughs> in a way. Yeah. And at the same time, it's a very challenging time. It's hard at times to, you know, stay focused uh, on your practice. And I've talked to other artists about this and also some younger artists feel this too. There are some artists that, you know, a couple of artists who I mentor who you know, who've asked me about this because, you know, they're working and they're practice trying to establish what they do. They're playing, they're trying to figure it out. And at the same time, there's this weight that we are under at the moment that is um, causing them to question the importance of who they are and what they do. Like, what is art, right? When, um, I think art is very important and, uh, you know, it's very important to just keep, just to keep going and keep at it. So 
I don't know. Like I have times when I, you know, I do pause and think about these things. And yeah, it's just a very challenging time. I don't know what to say, <laughs> but I, you know, it's a really emotionally challenging time. It takes much to keep oneself focused and steady and to concentrate on a practice. And I feel like I'm doing something that is culturally important when there's so many ways that, you know, you know, when there are so many ways that people's lives are tangibly, tangibly being um, impacted at the moment, it can be hard, right? Because uh, when you think of yourself as a, a practitioner of art, however, my work has always been about, you know, people and presence and, um, you know, identifying who we are in all types of spaces and yeah, I don't know. It's very, it is a very challenging time, but I think that's, um, <laughs> I don't know, this is such a mess in the lady that I'm doing. <laughs> oh, it's not. I hope they didn't do that. something with this. <laughs> but, it, but it is, uh, you know, because it is kind of hard. I remember at the beginning of like the COVID time, at the beginning of COVID, um, I was like, okay, now we're on lockdown. What are we going, what am I going to do? And then Trudeau said, Canadians abroad, it's time to come home. And so I immediately went to the art store and bought some panels and I started working on, you know, earlier series, um, specifically the Smiths. Mm -hmm. And I honestly feel that, you know, there was, this, I had started doing, you know, these, these, um, these Smiths that were just done in black, right? They were, they were very monochrome, very simple, very subtle Smiths. And I was distracted because I started to, I started the university, I started to do my master's, I got into all of these other things, the transfers took control. And then, uh, you know, in January or February, whenever it was, I felt, oh, wow, now I can just go back to what I was doing before and look at these pieces of which I think has a real resonance with community and of which I know a lot of people I know find a connection with, right? They see themselves in the Smiths, which is so my intention. And I love it when people say that to me. As time went on and then that whole incident with George Floyd happened, you know, it just shook it just shook me and it shook so many people I know. And then we are inundated with uh, the media, inundated personally um, on our personal social media platforms. And I don't know, I just became even more uh, focused on getting this work done. It was like, this time of stillness that caused me to just do something that is repetitive, just to keep on going and to keep sane, right? And I think that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> Actually, right now, because we're entering a time where people are kind of getting used to the time in a way, I've been able to start to develop other projects and to project plan and to, you know, play a little bit more and to be excited about future possibilities. However, yes, that was my experience of just trying to um, manage by doing something that is repetitive, that, that still felt like there was meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's the point that I hope the editor will, will end it on. But just on a, on a personal note, I just want to say um, that question was probably unfair. And I'm sorry to ask. But oh, like, no, it was. Oh, no, because your, your work has always been political since, you know, it is not at, at South mm -hmm. Africa when you had the close-up crop, mm -hmm. you know, uh, portraits of, of Black faces, um, you know, that I, I think was intended to um, highlight aspects of beauty and, and then... Um, like the plain black series and just um, all of your work. And it's not like, 
I haven't been able to watch the George Floyd video, but yeah. um, it's not as if you know that was the first time it's happened. It's been happening, you know, <coughs> constantly and. It's also a layering because it's not only George Floyd, but Breonna Taylor at the same time. Yes. Breonna wasn't getting as much right. focus as George Floyd was. So there's not only this race component, but there's this gender component. And it yeah. just it, it just was layered and layered and layered yeah. and a thoughtfulness attached to it. And this time, there's so much time that has gone by that the, I find the question is relevant and uh, we can kind of like, you know, take time to think on that question. Like, how did it actually affect you? And even just now talking, I'm feeling like emotions, yeah. you know, and I think it's, you know, many things, you know, that it is emotional and that I'm talking to you and I know that you have a, a care there, right? You are impacted by it as well. And so, yeah, I've never really sat and had a thoughtful, honest conversation about now I'm getting all emotional <laughs> don't include this <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. so it is a very relevant question and it's a question of care you know and we should be able to talk about these things and um it's yeah. hard to be vulnerable about it too though. Oh, exactly yeah because we're always supposed to be so tough and you know we're so tough and together and yeah right? I'm always, as well as I hope that people do admit that they're always in development. You know, I always feel like an emerging artist trying to figure out what I'm doing day by day. I'm hoping that this will come across the way I want it to come across. And I've also, you know, I have to like, you know, do something and put it aside and let's move on because I can do well in something for so long, right? It's just not, uh, you know, productive to just stay somewhere. So, yeah. <laughs> can I um I just say thank you for doing this with me and asking me to do this with you